Cliff and I have been playing the same game of tag for over 15 years now. It's just a dumb kid's game, yet I'm terrified for my life. It began the summer before secondary school. Cliff had just moved to Sheffield, a few streets from my house. I saw him at the park a few times by himself. One day, he simply walked over and asked if I wanted to play a game of tag. I agreed, and we've stayed friends ever since. All through our teenage years, the gap year and university, we've kept this game of tag bubbling between us. Why? I could never muster a satisfying answer. I guess we were both competitive people. We liked to win, and nobody lost as long as the game kept going. After university, I had to move to London to chase my dreams of being a cinematographer. Cliff was staying put. He had a life here now. He'd been seeing Olivia for a couple of years by that point, and things were getting serious. During our farewell, he hugged me close before tapping me on the shoulder. Tag, you're it, he whispered. We promised to see each other every few weeks, but life got in the way like it always does. My career semi took off, and Cliff started a family with Olivia, giving birth to their first child, Rosie. The game became an excuse to visit each other for our birthdays. We'd surprise the birthday boy by turning up unannounced and tagging them. This went on for many years, the element of surprise fading into the background. It was simply an excuse to keep our friendship alive. A few years back, I'd had some time off between projects without much to do. I hadn't heard from Cliff for a while, so I decided to genuinely surprise him for his birthday. The plan? Turning up on his doorstep a week early, tagging him and then demanding we go out and get drunk. I packed up my camper van and drove to Sheffield. It felt like the perfect plan, but it turned out to be the worst decision of my life. It was 8 p.m. by the time I parked up outside of Cliff's house. The place was dark, but Cliff's car was parked in the driveway. I watched the house for a few minutes to see if anyone was home. A figure moved by one of the bay windows of the living room, still shrouded in darkness. Somebody was home. I crept up the drive and went to knock on the door. Just as my knuckles were about to strike, Cliff appeared in the doorway, dressed as if he was about to head out. What the fuck? He said, his expression frozen in stern shock. I threw my hands up and smiled. Surprise! He didn't say anything for a while. He just stared at me, his mouth forming into a slight grimace. I slowly leaned forward, extended my finger and jabbed him in the chest. Tag, you're it! I said, does Olivia know you're coming? No, but... You can't just drop in like this, he said. That's why I bought my camper. I'll sleep in there tonight. I just want a couple of beers. Let me talk to Olivia. I'm sure I can convince her, I said. Cliff shook his head and yanked the front door closed with some force. She's taken Rosie to see her mum for the week. Her grandpa is on his last legs. Sorry to hear that, I said, waiting the appropriate amount of time before speaking again. But am I right in thinking that means you're free tonight? I gave him my best shit-eating grin. Cliff looked back at the door, then at me. He kicked some mud off his shoe like a bashful kid. Fine, a couple of pints, no more. I've got a busy day tomorrow, he said. After six beers, Cliff was in a much better mood. He seemed more relaxed than I'd seen him in years. I knew his job was tough, something complicated with finance, great pay but terrible work-life balance, and raising a kid can't be easy. But now he was cracking jokes, buying tequila shots, and even sneaking a few cheeky cigarettes from me. It felt like we were teenagers again, just two best friends enjoying each other's company. Cliff came stumbling back to the table, 
two pints sloshing in his hands. He slumped into the stool next to me and slapped me on the back. You really got me, man, he slurred. I wrapped my arm around his shoulder. I was always the better player, I said. That always used to wind him up. He smiled at me like a banshee, all teeth and gums. I'm going to get you when you least expect it, he said, his tone almost musical. It took us twice the time to get home, with multiple sick and piss stops along the way. Our conversation dwindled as we eventually arrived at his house. I unlocked the camper van and went to step in. You can come in if you want, he said, the first words he'd spoken in the last ten minutes. His tone was desperate, like the lonely kid I met on the playing field all those years ago. My vision was spinning like a merry-go-round. I don't think I'll make it, I need to sleep. Sure? he asked. I nodded, causing a sharp pain behind my right eye. The hangover headaches were already creeping across my skull. He was working the next day, so I promised not to disturb him. I had a long drive back anyway and needed a few pit stops to pick up snacks and to question my life choices before getting home. We hugged goodbye and he squeezed me tight. I thought I was going to be sick. A week later, I thought I would be sick again, but for a very different reason. Back at home, I was prepping for a shoot when the police called. Did I know I'd spent the night with a murderer? Cliff had stabbed Olivia and Rosie the morning before I visited. One minute he was having breakfast with his family. The next, he was puncturing holes into both of them with a fillet knife. Their blood was still oozing over the kitchen tiles by the time I arrived just a few hours later. He'd left them to rot there while we got drunk together. The police almost seemed delighted to talk to me, certain that I could shed some light on the case. That certainty was quickly replaced with mild shock and deep frustration as I told them that we'd spent the whole night together and that I'd noticed absolutely fuck all. Cliff seemed fine, better than fine. He seemed great. There was no motive, no suspects and no leads. One thing was for certain, they'd been a happy family. No evidence of secret affairs or hidden debts. It was like Cliff simply decided to detonate the life he'd spent so long building. I loved Olivia and Rosie and now they'd been wiped from the planet by someone I'd called my best friend. I spent the next few weeks in a daze, replaying the night endlessly in my head, searching for clues to what had happened to my friend of 15 years. You'd think all that time with someone would mean that you'd get a grasp on the kind of person they are. What a joke. We all wear masks, but some are hiding uglier faces than others. So much of the night was a blur, it was hard to piece it all together. But there was one moment that I couldn't shake. I'm gonna get you when you least expect it. Was Cliff still playing tag with me? The police said he'd gone into hiding somewhere in the Peak District. They were searching high and low, but they hadn't found a clue yet. He'd packed nothing and left on foot. The lead officer believed he'd gone out into the woods to die, that we'd find his body washed up in a ditch somewhere. But I knew better. If there was still a hint of the old cliff out there, he'd be plotting to get me back. He never liked to lose, and while he was it, he was losing. Months went, and still nobody knew where Cliff had gone. I knew he hadn't gone far. He was out there, creeping along the peripheries of my vision, waiting for the best opportunity to strike. I shed friends and jobs like a dying snake. I couldn't leave the house knowing there was a chance he was still out there. He'd appear in busy crowds, smiling just like he did when I saw him after he'd murdered his family. Sometimes the crowds would part and I'd realize it wasn't Cliff. 
other times, his features, now gaunt and wild, remained unchanged. One night, I was in my office reviewing some footage for a new film I was working on. I looked out my window, and there he was, crouched by my shed, obscured by shadows. I told myself it was just a trick of my mind. But then, I saw his face, pale white and illuminated by the full moon. He was smiling. I grabbed my phone off the desk and called the police, but by the time they picked up, he was gone. Months turned to years, and Cliff still hadn't been found. The police had uncovered some human remains in a cave a few miles outside of Sheffield, but they hadn't been able to identify who it was or how long they'd been there. Interest in the story dwindled, and everyone moved on to the next violent atrocity. Even I had stopped seeing him so much, except for the occasional nightmare. My bank account had dried up, and I needed to find work. I spent the last of my savings on a therapist to untangle me from the web of shame and paranoia that kept me trapped inside my house. Questions still plagued me. How was I meant to trust someone again? Do we ever really know the people we love? What made Cliff do what he did? I came to accept that I would never find out the answers. After many long and painful sessions, I finally started to feel like a shell of a normal human. I was able to leave the house, look people in the eye, and begin to rebuild my life. But the guilt never left. Even after all the pain I'd been through, at least I was still alive. That's more than can be said about Olivia and Rosie. I'd celebrated with the man who wiped them from this world and spent the night sleeping next to their corpses. I needed to move on from this nightmare, and the only way to do that was to say a final goodbye. I packed up my camper van and headed to Sheffield, to the cemetery where they were both buried. It was a cold, bitter winter morning. The wind tugged at my hair and clothes as I marched along the endless rows of crumbling graves, desperately searching for Olivia and Rosie. I eventually found them tucked away in a quiet corner underneath a great oak tree. The wind screamed through its branches, creating a ceaseless white noise. I tried concentrating on the names carved on the graves, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My heart was racing. Why had I come here? A branch snapped behind me. I spun around. It was a squirrel watching me from a few rows along. It cocked its head at me before running as fast as it could in the other direction. There wasn't another soul in the entire cemetery. I was utterly alone. I took a deep breath and looked back at the names Olivia and Rosie. I said I was sorry and replaced the crusted remains of some old flowers with the fresh daffodils I'd bought. Clearly nobody had visited them in a long time. Something deep in my gut told me that Cliff was gone. He'd lost his mind and starved to death in the middle of some woods. The end of an unexplainable tragedy. I said goodbye to all three of them that day and drove home but sometimes your gut instinct can be wrong. So very, very wrong. Last week, I was at a house party against my will. My newish girlfriend had dragged me there and told me it would be fun. It was anything but. I'd necked a bottle of wine in less than an hour and the queue to the toilet was four people deep. My bladder isn't what it used to be so I snuck out into the garden to find a secluded spot. As I stepped outside, the floodlight illuminated the garden in a stark white. I crept to a shadowy corner. After a few seconds, the garden turned black as the floodlight switched off. For a while, all I could hear was the sound of my own piss. Then I heard the pattering of feet behind me. They were rushing at full pace, the floodlights switched back on. I spun around. A naked figure was running across the garden towards me. It was Cliff, 
and he was coming fast, his body lean and muscular like an animal. His skin was smeared in dirt and muck, some old, some new, with a long scrappy beard and greasy hair. He grinned at me with missing teeth. His thick right arm was outstretched. His dark eyes glinted in the moonlight. Five giant fingers stabbed my chest, sending a jolt of sharp pain across my ribs. The force pushed me back against the garden fence. I tried to let out a scream, but it got caught in my throat. Cliff put his face up close to mine, his rotten breath stinging my nostrils. Tag, you're it, he said. He leant across me and took a deep breath by my neck, as if savouring my scent for the final time. Then he leapt back and ran back across the garden at a horrific speed, disappearing over the garden fence. I whimpered as I slid down the fence, trying to hold back the tears. Nobody believes me. Not even the police. I can't lose more years of my life hiding away in my house. I need to take control. Cliff is out there, alive. Not only that, he's winning at tag. And I can't let that murdering piece of shit win. I've got to hunt him down for Olivia and Rosie. Fuck it, for me too. I'm going to find him. And I'm going to end this game once and for all. <laughs>